and I know you've been listening to everybody for a long time here, and I echo Ben's uh, very, uh, very uh, strong thank you to all of you for this extreme service and extraordinary service. We really appreciate it. I'm going to go really fast um, and try to go as quick as I can so that you can get a break from us and go make your decision. I know you're probably itching to do it at this point. But this is very important to us, and we appreciate your listening, and we appreciate your being here. I'm going to stay on this slide for a moment, and there's something that's very important on this slide that hasn't been brought to your attention by Mr. Depp's team. When you see the actual damages, go down to the last paragraph, if you will. It says, Mr. Depp cannot recover damages for any harm that occurred after November 2, 2020. Do you all see that? So what Mr. Depp's team got up here and told you through Mr. Chu this morning has nothing to do with this case. He had his chance in the UK. He, the, the lawsuit was filed June 2018, six months before the op-ed. The trial was July 2020. The process ended, according to Mr. Marks, their expert, on November 2, 2020. And his damages stop then. He, he can't get reputational damages. He can't get his legacy back for his children. He can't get anything after that day from you. You can't restore his reputation. You can't give him anything. They didn't tell you that, but the court told you that. And that's a very, very important thing here. He told his story. He had his opportunities. He had his full opportunities to do all of that. And he came in here and lied to you and said he's here to get his reputation back. It's just one of many lies in this case, but it's a really big one. Because here we are, six weeks of your time, precious time, six weeks of this court's time, for what? For nothing only to go after Amber. That's psychological abuse. He's going after Amber for nothing because he wants to put her through this again, the third time. So we're fighting back, and that's the counterplay. She finally has said, enough, enough. And we're asking you to finally hold this man responsible. He has never accepted responsibility for anything in his life. You've heard it this whole time. He hasn't admitted to anything. He's blamed everybody in the world, his agent, his manager, his lawyer, Amber, his friends, everybody. But he's never accepted responsibility for a thing he's done in his life. But we're asking you to accept, to, to make him accept responsibility, to hold him legally responsible for his actions and to fully and fairly compensate Amber for what he has done by creating this concept of a hoax for the defamation that he has committed that you have heard so much about that just took wildfire and went off into negative media and has made Amber's life pure hell up to this day. We're asking you to do that, to compensate her, to, to be fair and hold him responsible so he stops. We don't want another lawsuit. We don't want anything else. We want to leave Amber alone and let her get on with her life and raise her child. So let's talk about the counterclaim for a moment. These are Adam Waldman's statements. You've heard Mr. Depp say, well, why, are you, why aren't you suing Mr. Waldman? <laughs> that, isn't that typical of Mr. Depp? He doesn't take responsibility for anything, so not, now he's going to blame his lawyer. But the evidence is very clear on all three statements, and we'll show them to you in a minute that he says Adam Waldman, Mr. Depp's attorney, says these things. Now, Mr. Depp says, oh, I didn't even know about those until the counterclaim. Well, we know that's not true because Mr. Waldman's testimony was two months before those statements were made. In February of 2020, Mr. Depp accompanied Mr. Waldman to the Daily Mail, the same place that all three of these statements were published, and he gave him two spliced audio tapes to try to make it look like Amber was the person who was committing the abuse. He went with him. He knew that Mr. Waldman was doing this. 
He knew that Mr. Waldman was launching a campaign against Amber to try to discredit her. And the timing of this, we're talking, the statements now are April and June of 2020. The trial is July of 2020. So they're launching an attack to try to discredit Amber before the trial in the UK. That's what happened here. And that is Mr. Waldman, but it's Mr. Depp. The judge gave you three different instructions and you all have them. He's acting as his attorney. He has the authority. So Mr. Depp is standing in the shoes of Mr. Waldman. Mr. Waldman is standing in the shoes of Mr. Depp. Michelle, can you please bring up the first statement? <coughs> says, Amber and her friends in the media use fake sexual violence allegations as both a sword and shield, depending on their needs. They have selected some of her sexual violence hoax facts as the sword, inflicting them on the public and Mr. Depp. Now, what this statement is meant to imply <coughs> is that Amber is lying about the sexual assaults and using them with the media to try to discredit Mr. Depp. That's the clear implications of this. Now, the, the first part of this is this contradicts Mr. Depp's claims today that the first time you ever heard about the sexual assaults that happened was in this case. It was in the UK case. This is the case that Mr. Depp brought in the UK. And instead of Amber Heard trying to put this out in the media, she did exactly the opposite. Now, this article's not in your evidence, but at least some of you will remember it being shown at one point with the title that said that Amber was successful in being able to treat her allegations of the sexual violence confidential in that proceeding. And it was treated confidential. She did exactly the opposite. She didn't want to tell people this. And you know that. You watched her on the stand. It was heart rendering for her to have to do this with the cameras, no less. But what else is false about this statement? It's that there was no false statements of sexual violence. Ben went through all four of them, and I will not repeat them all. You heard the testimony. And interestingly enough, you didn't hear any stories that differed from that with Mr. Depp. He didn't get on the stand and say, you know, no, this didn't happen to at least a couple of them. And he can't in Australia. He can't remember anything, likely. But if you just look at the pictures of the destruction in that house, I mean, imagine painting <coughs> those canvases and how long that took and how much hatred and rage you have to have for somebody to do something like that. Writing on the walls, tearing up her nightgown and, and wrapping pieces of raw steak and putting it all over the house. Uh, remember that she also testified that he took her clothes and swiped them through all the paint before she left. Um, you know these things happened. Um, with respect to the malice on this one, you know he knows that he did these things. You know that he knows he was out of it for three days. And that's all that we need to prove for malice. But there's a couple of more facts here. But you can find whatever Mr. Waldman's done, and you can find whatever Mr. Depp has done. And both of those are the same for purposes of evaluating the verdict form. They stand in each other's shoes. When you have an agent, and that's what the jury instructions say, you can go with both. What did Mr. Waldman do? There was an article about the sexual violence that he had put from the April one that went into the trial. Amber's testimony, she was sitting near him in the trial, Adam Waldman threw that newspaper down in front of her de defiantly. That's actual malice. Um, and she was quite, quite upset. And you heard her testimony on the stand about that. He was just inflicting it on her. Remember Bruce Whitkin's testimony. This was Johnny Depp's best friend for 40 years until he testified truthfully four years ago uh, about the drugs and alcohol and he stopped talking to him. There was a couple of really important things that Bruce Whitkin said. One of the things he said, he met Adam Waldman once. Adam Waldman said, do you have any dirt on the Mandels? And he said no, and that was it. Then he didn't care. He is an attack dog. All he wants to do is attack and, and put dirt on people. The second, second thing that Whitkin said that I think was pretty instructive was that, that Johnny Depp has deep-seated anger issues that have nothing to do with Amber. 
He remembered even back when Johnny was married to his sister-in-law, he had extreme jealousy even back then. Uh, and I think that's pretty significant. Remember, Mr. Wickham also was called in a few times to intercede in some of these fights between Johnny and Amber when he, when he would become so angry. The last thing I thought he said that was actually pretty important um, was that Kipper and his whole group are a scam. He said, you know, how is it that they can be sober, sober doctors, you know, for these years, years, and he's never sober. You know, he's even taking pot all the time. How can you be sober? I thought that was quite instructive. But in any event, going back to, that's the first statement. The second statement, Michelle, if you can bring that one up. Oh, before I go there, I want to talk about a few more things from Mr. Waldman that you have in your, in your uh, pocket to be able to find additional malice with him. Remember, he's the one that after the UK trial went to the LAPD with a notebook full of things and tried to get perjury charges against Amber. The LAPD said, we don't investigate those things. Um, but he then went to a German newspaper and said, Amber is being investigated by the NYPD, or the uh, LAPD, for perjury. Do you remember that? That's malice. That's showing his intent to do harm to Amber. Uh, he also admitted that he speaks to that umbrella guy, and you'll see that one text in there from the person from TMZ. That umbrella guy is the big lead of Johnny Depp's, you know, positive uh, uh, social media that is putting all the negative out on Amber, Amber Heard. Uh, and he also ended up getting knocked out of Twitter because he was abusing Amber. Um, so now we'll go to the second counterclaim statement. And that is quite simply, this was an ambush, a hoax. They set Mr. Depp up by calling the cops, but the first attempts didn't do the trick. The officers came to the penthouses, thoroughly searched and interviewed, and left after seeing no damage to face or property. So Amber and her friends spilled a little wine, roughed the place up, got their story straight under the direction of a lawyer and publicist, then placed a second call to 911. Now this is May 21. Now the clear implication here is that they're saying that Amber got together with her friends. They decided they were gonna set Johnny up to be charged for domestic violence. And so they called the police and they tried to make up this whole story, get him arrested, but the police said there's no evidence here uh, and went away and they said, darn. And so they spilled wine and they you know, busted up the place and they called 911. They got, they got advice from a lawyer and a publicist called 911 and tried again to get Johnny charged. That's what this, this says. Now we all know that's false and it's heinously false um, because you know after these events happened and Ben talked about a little bit of it but I'll talk about the rest of it and I'm going to try to do it really quickly. Um, but, but we all know Amber did everything in her power not to tell them who Johnny was, not to press charges, not to have him arrested. The exact opposite of this. But what were the facts of May 21st? He comes over, he's already been drinking, he's already high, and he is on a tear about feces in the bed from a month ago. And remember how Amber talked about when he gets into these drug-induced things, he gets into these paranoias, and he gets some idea in his head, and he just won't let it go. And that was his this time. There's somebody put that feces in the bed a month ago. That was his spin. So she gets Io Tillett on, on the phone. He's in New York at the time. He's going, they thought, this is ridiculous. Of course nobody did. And by the way, Boo has this huge problem. Of course it was Boo. You know, he's always doing this. But Johnny just won't get there. So then they laugh. That makes him mad. Then he throws the phone at Amber. Amber screams out and says, ow, you just threw the cell phone at me. It hurts. Io says, Amber, get out of there. Johnny gets madder, pulls her hair, grabs her and starts hitting her. So Io gets hold of Rocky Pennington. She comes over as quickly as she can. She goes and gets in between the two of them. She puts her hands up on his chest. He pushes them down. And then she continues to stand in between them. And he's screaming loudly 10 times, Amber, get the fuck up, Amber, get the fuck up, Amber, get the fuck up, loudly, loudly. Uh, then his, his bodyguards hear this, they come in, they break it up. That's how that happens. But the next part of this, 
Remember Josh Drew, and, and I think Elizabeth Mars was amazing in this one. Remember their testimony? You know, he, for after that, he goes and he has to, you know, he always leaves a you know, path of destruction as he's leaving. So he, you know, bashes up things, and you saw Ben's pictures here on the picture frames, knocks things over as he's going, goes down the hallway, he's splashing the wine, he gets his bodyguards to let him into Penthouse 5. That's where Josh and Elizabeth are trying to help with Rocky's bead thing for the next day. And he comes in storming in, and he says, get your bitch out of here. And he's got the big magnum, and he's mad. And Elizabeth is just terrified. She barely knows Johnny. She's met him four times, and she goes ripping out of there as fast as she can. And Josh gets out of there, too. Then what does he do? Uh, he rearranges the furniture. Or he might have knocked something off, you know, one of, one of the countertops or something, I think, is the, is the testimony of his bodyguards. But you saw the pictures. He went through and trashed that place again as he left. Now, the next part of this is the police coming. Io calls the police. He's in New York. He calls the New York Police 911. He's afraid they're not going to get there fast enough. He still remembers December 15 because he came in afterwards and saw all of the injuries on Amber and all the evidence. Um, and he's terrified that, that Amber's still in there, the police haven't come, and that Johnny's going to kill her. So he calls a friend in LA and says, Please call 911. We've got to get somebody there fast. So she calls 911. So we have two calls, and you'll see the call summary. And the call summary shows those two calls r really close in prox proximity here. So it's not them, uh-oh, we didn't get the first police officer, so we'll rough up the place and make a second one. You'll see that they're like eight minutes apart uh, up there. But it took two hours to dispatch the two different ones, and Amber never even had any idea that the second one was coming. The first one's come. And, you know, we've talked about it, we've shown you the pictures. The police officers admitted that those pictures could, could very much have been what was there that night. Remember, Doc, Officer Haddon, it was his first week on the job. Officer Science was three, three years on the job at that point. They say, you know, they told Josh that if she will press charges, if she'll give a name, we can file a report and make an arrest. She wouldn't do it. You did hear from Detective Sandanaga. That's the domestic first violence. First, 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 first. You recall Josh Drew saying that the police officer told him, you know, she'll give a name, we'll make an arrest. He definitely said that. Um, but in any event, uh, uh, she would not uh, She would not cooperate. She didn't want to. But, but Detective Sandanaga, their domestic relations or domestic violence uh, person, said they should have done an incident report no matter what, even if they decided there wasn't a crime. Because domestic violence it has the cycles, they come back, and it's good to have the record for the next time that it might happen. So she said they should have under the circumstances, even if they didn't. And she also said that when they put verbal dispute only in those calls, it is a code that they use, and you'll see that it's twice on that call report, so they, to, to say that's why we didn't write a report. Um, but in any event, whether the police officers you know, forgot about it two months later when they were first asked about it, whether they just decided she's never going to press charges, and you'll see on the call report they're insisting that to the second set, it doesn't make any difference. The point is, this is still false. This statement is still false because Amber did everything but try to press charges against Johnny Depp. So they go away. Uh, and the testimony is that Josh and Amber and Rocky cleaned up because they have dogs, so they cleaned up a lot of the glass and the wine and, and those types. They had no idea the second police officers were coming by, and they certainly didn't call them, and they certainly didn't talk. They never talked to a publicist. She did talk to a lawyer who gave her advice, and that's why she wouldn't tell them you know, anything. She said, I'm not going to cooperate at all. Um, so the second one's coming. You saw that. You've got the video cameras in there. And you see there's no effort by them to try to get 
Now these officers to press charges against Johnny Depp, just the opposite. Josh Drew doesn't want to even let him in the place. Uh, they come through quickly. Everything's fine. They wave. Everything's fine. Are they trying to press charges against Johnny? No. They're not trying to do anything. They're trying to get him out of there, which makes this statement 100% false. Was it made with malice? Absolutely. There's nobody that thinks that Amber tried to press charges that night. Johnny knew that. But the other thing that's very helpful and what you should look at is Defendants Exhibits 772 and 773. Because once again, the next day, Johnny apologizes to Amber. He says in two different text messages, that 772 and 773, um, he says, my profound apologies in one of them and my apologies are eternal in the other one. What is he apologizing for the next day on May 22nd if he didn't know that he did all of those things? And by the way, remember Isaac Baruch even remembers the wine in the hallway. The police, none of the police officers remember the wine. And that's because they're busy and they got a zillion other things going and they didn't remember this call two months later when they were asked about it. Um, so that's, that's the next one. Um, so clearly, that's 100% false. Clearly, they knew it. Clearly, there's malice in making that statement. They're trying to suggest that she's manufacturing evidence with her friends to try to frame Mr. Depp. Nothing could be further from the truth on that one. And there's not, she did not want those police officers to press charges. Now, let's go to the third one. Oh, and let's talk about the makeup just for a moment while we're going to the third one. This makeup thing, fresh faced, natural. These were Adam Waldman planting these when he when he talked to the ECB people. You know, remember the testimony here. We kept asking, so did you talk to Mr. Waldman? Did you talk to Mr. Waldman? Mr. Waldman was trying to plant in all of these people's Objection, homes, Your Honor. Somehow she wasn't did he approach? So I didn't say that any of the witnesses admitted that Adam Walton planted that. I'm saying he planted it. That's me arguing the planting. And that's because it's all the same thing. She wasn't wearing any makeup. She was natural. She wasn't wearing a stitch of makeup. Every one of them says it. It's the exact same thing. Well, why would you say that? She's an actor. She's not going to go outside her house, you know, without putting makeup on. And if she has bruises, why on earth? when she's been covering them up for four years, why on earth would she not put makeup on so that she would cover those up? Why on earth would she not want to cover up those bruises? It makes no sense. But you know what, you guys saw her here. You guys saw it. Um, you saw Amber on the stand. There were days where she didn't wear eye makeup. A lot of people think that she's not wearing makeup when she doesn't have mascara and, and eyeliner. She has different looks, and some of them are with eye makeup, and some of them are without. And people misunderstand, especially people that aren't that good at makeup, and a lot of men, frankly, um, go, oh, that's, then she probably doesn't have makeup. And that's where that mistake happens. But you heard her testimony, and you heard her makeup artist.